have your Bibles. They're still receiving the offering, but uh, if you can, if you you got enough fingers, if you can turn to three places, you can turn to First Corinthians chapter four, to Mark chapter four, and then Hebrews eleven six. Hallelujah. It's been my heart um, and in my heart for a number of months to go back. And if you've been here or listening online, you know I've been talking about just going back to the foundations of faith. And uh, that's what this church is all about. That's what uh, our founding pastor, mentor, my mentor, and um, teaching and living a life of faith. Right. And here in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, Paul is talking here and says, Therefore I urge you, imitate me. For this reason, I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. You know, Dr. Savell taught us truth. He taught us the word. He gave us prophetic words. And my role here is as a pastor that oversees the church that him and Miss Carolyn established is to continue to speak the things he spoke, Amen. continue to teach the things he taught, they taught. And uh, I came across a quote this morning and, and, um, of Jerry Savelle, and it says this, anyone can believe God, anyone can believe God is good when things are going well. But it takes faith to believe in his goodness when your life seems to be shattered around you. Let me read that again, and this is from Dr. Savell. Anyone can believe God is good when things are going well, but it takes faith to believe his goodness when your life seems to be shattered all around you. And I woke up this morning, and I had prepared a, a message throughout the week. I'm always preparing, to seeking the Lord about what direction to go, what to deposit in our hearts. And uh, when I woke up, I heard, I heard this uh, phrase, and it said this, don't look towards your future in fear. Amen. And so I kind of just shifted directions on what I believe, what I, what I was going to minister. And I just, I just had that, this came up strong in my heart. And, and let me read it again. Don't look towards your future in fear. You know, with graduates, whether high school, whether college graduates, whether marriages, whether you, you're, you're, you believe you're called to ministry, really, it doesn't matter. It's not, I'm not trying to single out any one people group in this room today because these are things that we all deal with. We all deal, deal with and will be confronted with this aspect of fear of the unknown. Right. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me. He said, don't look towards your future in fear. Don't look towards your future in fear. So the enemy wants you, would want to get you off your purpose, get you off your destiny, and how he'll do that is through fear. If he can get us into fear, he can get us into becoming idle, get us into, into not pressing into God, you know, most of the time when you're, when you're experiencing battles in your life, you're experiencing setbacks in your life, even physical symptoms in your body, oftentimes the last thing you want to do is see God. Am I the only one? Now, now I, I've, I've grown a lot in the Lord, so I know when, the, when attacks come, I, I, I'm, I'm equipped better now than I used to be, but that doesn't mean that I still don't have to battle the fear of the unknown. What's next? How is this going to turn out? You know, I don't, want to, I don't want to confront that situation. I don't want to deal with this situation. I, I don't want that to happen. What if this happens? And what if I make the wrong decision? What if I make the wrong choice? What if I, what if I go to the wrong city? What if I do this? And what if I do that? And, and next thing you know, you end up not doing anything because you're not looking forward in faith and you're, you're actually looking, you're, you don't get beyond the presence because of fear, the present because of fear. Let's look at Mark chapter 4. To this time in the life of the disciples, 
the disciples had seen some miracles. They saw fish multiply. They saw healings. They saw Jesus encountering different people saying, hey, follow me. So we see the disciples are understanding and have, and have a, they're seeing some things about following the Lord. They're seeing some things about going from being fishermen to following a rabbi to go to places they'd never been before. And they're seeing some amazing things. They're seeing some things that, that in the natural are really impossible. And so let's look at, let's pick up the story, looking in verse 35. It says, on the same day when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Title today is, let's go to the other side. Verse 36 says, Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boats as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, Amplified says, a storm of hurricane proportion. And it says, And the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow, and they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? Then he arose and he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? How is it that you have no faith? If you have no faith, that means you're empty of faith. It means you're without a force that has the ability to get you over. You're without something, and that something is the very thing you need to take you to the other side. I want you to know what's going to take you to the other side of the obstacle, the storm, whatever you're facing, is going to be your faith in God. Amen. Well, let's unpack this just a little bit through this. I read a bunch of scriptures, but let's take this line by line. Verse 37, a great wind arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. You know, growing up in Maryland, and, you know, we would have hurricanes. And there was, I remember one time, uh, one summer, we were, in Mar- we were I- at the beach, and we lived not too far from the beach. And it was a place where we spent our vacations. Oh, by the way, Virginia and Paul are here. Yeah. My mom and dad are here, so please stand so they can acknowledge you. <laughs> so, yeah, you, you've, you've been listening to the stories, haven't you? <laughs> so, so one summer, I remember being at, the, being at the beach, and there was a report of a hurricane coming in. I don't remember what, which name this was that was attached to this hurricane at this time. But I remember it was kind of like something that was, that was as a child, seeing the wind, and you, here you are in a high-rise building that's uh, 12 stories high, and you're on like floor number six, and you're looking out of your balcony, and you're seeing waves that, that, that are 20 feet tall crashing on the ocean. It's almost like, you know, we're, we're only an hour and a half from home. Why didn't we just like just go inland? But, you know, we pay good money for this, this, this condo, so we're going to... We're going to stay. I, I don't know what their thought, but do you remember, you remember when those storms that would come through? And, and so, you know, I'm looking out and like the whole metal roof blows off of the, blows off of the, the top of the condo. And I'm like, you know, in my small young mind knew that, that this probably wasn't good. <laughs> Here we are. There's, then it was all of a sudden my grandfather was like, you know, we probably need to come inside. So we're inside now looking out the window <laughs> And, and, and it's like the, the wind is, is going, you know, blowing. And, and, and it's like, you know, so when a, when a storm is there, it, it's not just the fact that it's raining. It's not just that there's, it's raining. It's not just that it's raining and there's a little bit of wind, but you can feel it and you can see it and you can hear it. 
So when we're talking about, you you have to understand, this was a real situation. This was a real story. And here they are in a boat on the Sea of Galilee. And it's not just a little cute story and say, oh, the little wind blew up and Jesus said, peace be still. And everything was great. And we went about. And wasn't that a good story? Unless you're the one that's in the boat. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what you're going through, but I do know this. I've been through storms. Maybe not to the extent that you've been through a storm or the storm that you're facing right now, but I do know this. You can feel the storm, you can see the storm, and you can hear the storm. Matter of fact, the storm is talking to you louder than you're talking to yourself. So when a storm comes against you, you can feel it, you can see it, and you can hear it. And I know the storm you're going through right now, you're feeling it, you're hearing it, and you're seeing it. He goes on and says, and it's already filling. Meaning there's something that's coming into the boat that doesn't, shouldn't be coming into the boat. See, the enemy wants to capsize you. The enemy wants to wants to keep you from going where? Now, this storm was not about a cute little test that Jesus was doing with the disciples just so he could say, Why is it you have no faith? I got him, God. (laughs) I got him. This was a great test. And, you know, you know, I just wanted to be able to, you know, you know, I was asleep, but, you know, I know you they were going to come get me and I was going to do this magic trick like peace be still. And it was all going to be good. And I could stand up and say this was just a test, guys. I just wanted you to see how much of a loser you really were. I just really wanted them to see on, on, on how bad they are and how, how the fact is they, I just wanted to test them to see what they were made of. I want you to know the, 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 the thing and the attacks that's come against your life is not to test you. God's not testing, trying to test your faith to see what you're made of by the storm that you're going through. God does not test us anything he's redeemed us from. God tempts no man with evil. This was to destroy them. This was to do what? Keep them from going to the other side. And I want you to know the attacks that you've experienced, the things that have affected you from your childhood all the way to an adult, the the storm that you're going through, the disappointment you're experiencing aren't just to see the fact that you need God more. Yes, we need God. We all need God. But the issue is the enemy doesn't want you on the other side. The enemy doesn't want you to get to the other side. Let me say it again. The enemy doesn't want you on the other side. He doesn't want you on the other side of addiction. He doesn't want you on the the side, other side of your insecurities. He doesn't want you on the other side of your losses. He doesn't want you on the other side of your failures, your mistakes. He wants you on the other side because you need to know on the other side, there's destiny. On the other side, there's purpose. On the other side, there's an assignment. On the other side, there's someone that needs to be set free. You see, the enemy did not want them to get to the other side because the enemy knew he had, he had that whole area in bondage because of one man. He didn't want them on the other side. Why? Because it was a de- demon-possessed man. If you get it, go read the next chapter. He didn't want them on the other side. He didn't want the miracle worker He didn't want the one that was anointed that came out of the wilderness and said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to set at liberty them that are bruised, proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. He didn't want the jubilee on the other side. So I need to keep this anointed Jesus from getting to this other side because I've got this whole community right where I want them. Because he didn't want that man set free. See, you need to go to the other side because there's people you need to set free. 
So Jesus went up, we know the story, Jesus went across there, set the demon-possessed man free. The demon-possessed man comes to Jesus, he said he's clothed in his right mind. He said, hey, Jesus, I want to follow you. And Jesus says, no. He goes, you need to stay over here and you need to go to Decapolis, which was 10 surrounding cities. And you need to go to all 10 cities and you need to tell them what took place. God needs people set free because they need to be a mouthpiece for the kingdom of God. And you have to overcome the storm you're facing because there's other people that need to be set free so they can set other people free. Your freedom is now. It's time to go to the other side because when you go to the other side, God's going to direct you. God's going to give you wisdom. God's going to give you insight. And I'm telling you, there's people that need to be set through you. It's time to go to the other side. But I'm telling you, that storm, that storm's going to come against you. That storm's going to try to fill up with water. And for, for a lack of a, 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 for us understanding what, you know, it's not like we're going through life in a natural boat, but what is, what is the thing that would fill up for us? Our hearts. Your heart just to overwhelm you by disappointments. Your heart just to be overwhelmed. That's what the enemy wants. He, he doesn't want you just to stop with the storm. He wants you to meditate on how bad the storm. He wants, to, he wants you to get into a place so, so far deep that you don't think that you'll ever have the ability to get out. So this morning, whether you realize it or not, I'm bailing your water out. I'm, I'm, I'm in, this morning, this morning, I'm in your boat with you, and I am bailing the water out. Hallelujah. Can somebody help me bail out some water this morning? Hallelujah. You got to, you, th this morning is all about bailing out the water because you got to go to the other side. Hallelujah. I speak freedom over you. I speak freedom over you. Your assignment will be fulfilled. Hallelujah. Your assignment will be fulfilled. So it was already filling up. But he, Jesus, was asleep on the pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care? Do you not care that we're perishing? This is where all of us, not one person has ever not dealt with that question. Now, you may not say it to your friends. You probably wouldn't say it to your pastor. It's something that you may never voice in front of someone else because you got to make sure that you're speaking the right faith-filled words in front of people. You may never have said it to anyone else, but I guarantee you thought it, and I'm guaranteeing that you spoke it in the car <laughs> when no one else is around. God, don't you care? See, care speaks of love. It speaks of concern. God, don't you care about me? God, I thought you loved me. See, that's, that the enemy would love, love to ha for us to hang out there. God, don't you love me? That's, that's what the disciples, don't you care? Don't you care that we're dying here? Don't you care that we're about to lose everything? Don't you care about me? We've all been there. If you didn't raise your hand, you'd be lying, and that'd be another sermon. <laughs> Don't you care about me? Annette would tell stories. Annette had the opportunity to raise 76-some children through a, through a boy's home, children's home. And I'm talking about you... you Some of the stories she would tell. 
I, I was telling someone a story of, remember Neri in Guatemala? Young boy Neri, we went to Guatemala and we get there and he is bandaged from head to toe like a mummy. The only thing you can see are his eyes. Do you, do you remember him, Nazanel? Dolores, I think, might have been with us. Well, his, I think it was his father, grandfather, didn't want him. And here he was, what, three, four, three years old and decided to put gasoline on him and set him on fire. I mean, some of the stories Annette would tell, man, goodness, I, I can't believe that parents would do that to a child. Prostitute them out at 10 years old. And this isn't another country. This, was, this is in Texas. Sorry to be graphic or if there's any young children here, parents, I apologize, but... And I remember when Annette would interview some of them and they would, she would talk to them about God and just would love on them and, and minister to them in these hard cases, these hard situations that really in the natural, you'd have all right to, to say, God, why did you let this happen to me? God, why? God. And, and so she would interview them. And I may not say it the way that she, she told me. And I wasn't planning on sharing any of this, by the way. But, but I remember she, she would say to them and just with tears going down her face, hearing their stories. And then where was God? Where was God when that was happening to me? Where was God when this was going on? Where was God when this, why, where was God? And she would, she would just look him in tears. And this was by the Holy Spirit. She would look at them and, and just hold their face and saying, I know God's real because you're with me now. And knowing that there's an enemy that does the things like this in the world, but my God didn't do those things. And I want you to know that God brought you into my life so I could show you the love of God. So I may not have ever experienced what you've gone through or what you might have walked through. I don't know what your shoes might have looked like and what feet, the way your feet looked and how your feet might need to be washed from your past. But, but I know this, he cares about you and he loves you. He loves you. He cares about you. But you understand the disciples were hearing the storm, seeing the storm. Their boat was filling up and they were like, don't you care that we're perishing? I want you to know that God cares about you. God cares about you. God cares what you're facing and what you're walking through. And here Jesus was asleep in the back of the boat. Now, most of the time we see ourselves from the position of the disciples for the longest time when I would read the scripture, I would always see myself from the position of the disciples, but then the Holy Spirit said, Justin, you need to start seeing yourself from the position of Jesus. Because the other thing we can do is we can, we can continue for the rest of our lives talking about how bad that storm was and never get over what happened to us. And we still keep talking about the storm we keep talking about the storm. Like, so I'm, hear me, I'm not belittling your storm. But I'm trying to get us to change perspective. That yes, I went through a storm. I've been, I've been through storms. I know you've been through the storm, storms that I can't comprehend. But I know God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he loves you. You're here today. You're here today. You know what? He still has a plan for your life and there's still another side you need to get to. There's still another side you need to get to. Your other side is still the other side. You know, God has plans and thoughts for us and here on this side, I know that God has a plan for me and, 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 and where Alyssa is, that's, that's, that's my final outcome. That's, that's my, the plan that God has for me. And sometimes between, between here and there, we may get off. We may get off track, and we may make wrong decisions and wrong choices, and and disappoint people, and we may end up way over here. But yet, that's my plan. But you know what? It's because God loves you. It can be in a moment that all you do is just a choice. 
It's just a choice. And the choice is, is saying, hey, I, I want to go your way for me, Lord. I, I'm going to go to the other side. And all it is is a choice. And next thing you know, you can make that choice and you get back on the plan that you're always meant to be on. It's time to go to the other side. Go to the other side. So Jesus was where? He was in the back of the boat. Thank you, Lord. Asleep on a pillow. We won't turn to Hebrews eleven six, but I will quote it. And this is a scripture we've been every week pretty much. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he is. And that he is, he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. I love how it says is because is always makes it present tense. But you know what? There's a difference between belief. You see, I believe something is. There's a lot of people in our nation. There's a lot of people in the world today that believe God is real. There's a lot of people that believe in God. Do you believe in God? Raise your hands. You believe in God. Years ago, George Barna did a statistic, and, and it was like they asked the question is, of, of Americans, and at this poll they said, how many people believe that believe in God? And it was like 85% of Americans voted yes, they believe in God. This was 20 years ago. It's probably changed now, but... <laughs> But then when they ask another question, how many people believe that Jesus is Lord? See, that's, that's two separate questions. Because, see, just believing that God is real is not what gets me to heaven. Me believing there is a God is not what gives me access to heaven, but is believing my heart and confessing with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. That's how I get into heaven. It's not by being a good person. But there's a difference between belief and faith. Or you could say, we put it this way, faith could be belief. But there's a difference between, let me put, I used to do this illustration and make sense of it, but uh, hand me your uh, chair there. Let's see. So how many people believe that this is a chair? Really? <laughs> See, you, you believe that this is a chair because you had experiences with chairs. Yes. From an early child, you, you, you sat in a, in a chair and you believe that that is a chair. That is a chair. Now, I can't talk, Roy, I could not talk you out of the fact that that is not a chair. There, there's nothing I could do or say that say, you know, that's not a chair, that's a horse. There's nothing I could do. Why? Because you are firmly rooted and believe that that is a chair. Yes. Just like there's a lot of people in here that you believe that Jesus is Lord. Do you believe that Jesus is Lord? Yes. Do you believe that God is real? Yes. See, the difference between faith and this another form of faith that I want to deal with for the rest of my time, there's a difference between belief and trust. I can believe that God is real just like I can believe that chair is real. But the question is, do I trust that it can hold me? See, there's a lot of people that we can believe that something is, but it's another level of understanding of faith when we trust in him. So you see, Jesus was asleep in the back of the boat. Why? Because he just didn't have a belief that he could go to the other side. Without faith, it's impossible to believe. Without faith, it's impossible to be believe. <laughs> Without faith, it's impossible to, <laughs> to please God. He that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. You can believe that God is real and never seek him. You can believe that he's real and never pursue him. You can believe that he's real and never get into his word. You can believe that he's real, but never lean all that you are upon him. 
well, God, I'll trust you with this, but mm, I believe that you're a provider, but I don't know about this giving thing because I don't trust that you can bring provision. So you can believe he's a provider, but yet trust is when I release my, my, I release my confidence, when I release my confidence in who he is. It's not just belief, but now I'm, I'm putting my life upon it. I'm leaning upon it. Going to the other side is all about, do you trust him? Just for the, light, for the rest of the time that we have today, I want you to, let's look at some things about trust. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah 17. Now, the Bible gives us a lot of descriptions and uses pictures to give us what, what um, trust looks like. See, trust is about I'm committed to this. When you say you trust God, you're saying, God, I'm committed to your word, and I know you're committed to me. It's just trust is I'm putting a line in the sand, and I'm not moving from this. This is... This is my faith, and I'm, I'm backing everything up behind that position. Amen. Verse 5. This gives us a picture of trust. Cursed is the man who trusts in man. I've done that too many times. Can I get an amen? Me too. So cursed is the man. Cursed. That, there's nothing about curse I like. No. Cursed is the man that makes, that trusts a man who makes flesh his strength. You know, if you are constantly trusting in yourself, you'll eventually hit a wall. Amen. For far too long, I allowed my flesh, I was, making my, I was making my flesh my strength. I was trying to do it in my own ability. Cursed is the man who trusts a man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. Listen, this is, this is a man that's trusting in man or the flesh is strength that's saying he's departed from the Lord. Verse 6, for he, this person that trusts in man, he's going to be like a shrub in the desert. In Texas, we could call that a mesquite tree. <laughs> he's going to be like a shrub in the desert. Now, what happens here? He'll be a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes. So even this person that's trusting in man, good is coming to that person. Isn't that odd? But he can't see it. How many times have you sat back and gone through a situation when you were trusting in yourself and refused to look at the breakthroughs you have had? You're so worried about what you're facing and what you're going through, you can't celebrate all the great and amazing things that happened in the past. You can't see it. You can't, there, there's good things happening. You can't celebrate with other people's good things because you're so caught in your negative. You can't, you can't look at someone else's success because you're too busy looking at your own failures. And that's what a person, that's when they're trusting in themselves or trusting in man. They can't see good when it comes but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in the salt land which is not inhabited. Verse 7 says, blessed is the man. See, I like this guy a whole lot better. Amen. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is the Lord. Is your hope the Lord's this morning? Amen. Blessed is the man who trusts. The person that trusts in the Lord is blessed. Wow, I like the sound of blessing. How about you? Amen. Blessing. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. The Lord is my hope this morning. Yes. Verse 8 tells us about this person that trusts in the Lord. It says, for he shall be like a tree. Now, the person that's trusting in a man is going to be like a shrub. But the person that's trusting God is going to be like a tree. Woo! Going to be like a tree planted by the waters. See, the person that is cursed, they're hanging out in the desert. 
If you hang out in the world, there's, no, there's nothing living there. That's why, that's why Jesus told the woman at the well, hey, come, c- come to me and I'll give you water you've never thirsted of before. Why? She, she, she could only get partially satisfied and couldn't, couldn't get satisfied in the world. So the difference is, ultimately, it comes down to the, the blessed person, the cursed person is, who are you hanging out with? Because this person that is blessed is they're planted by the waters. And it tells us what, it spreads out its roots by the river. Meaning the person that's trusting in God, your roots are spreading out. Your roots are going deep. Your roots are are locking in. So what happens when a storm comes to someone that is rooted and planted and the roots go deep? When that storm comes, they will not be moved. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters which spread out its roots by the river. Now get this. And will not fear when heat comes. Now you have to hear this. The person that's blessed, it does not say that heat doesn't come to them. Some people have the idea that, you know, I must be doing something wrong since I've had all these attacks in my life. No, maybe it's because you're doing something right. But yet the person that trusts in the Lord, it says they they don't fear when heat comes. It doesn't say heat doesn't come. It doesn't mean the the pressure doesn't come. The pressure is going to come. The temptation is going to come. The attacks are going to come. But the thing is, we don't fear it. We don't fear it. And it says, but it's leaf. And we'll not fear when heat comes, but it's leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought. You might feel, feel like, Pastor, I'm, it, it, my life is dry right now. But, but it says that this person that's, that's trusting in the Lord isn't in fear. It says they're not anxious in the year of drought. Yes. In the year of drought. A year can be 365 days of drought. In Texas, we know we've done like 100 and some days without rain, over 100 degrees. And that's when I miss Maryland. <laughs> but then I realized this is where I'm called to be. So, so this person that's even, even trusting in the Lord, they're in a year of drought. See, it goes back to again. It's like, so why if, I, if you just trust the Lord, you'll never have another problem a day in your life. Says who? No, it says here that even, even when I'm in a year of drought, what does it tell me? I'll not cease from yielding fruit. Hallelujah. Amen. It doesn't matter what you're going through. It doesn't matter what you're facing. You are always producing fruit. See, the person that trusts in the Lord, Pastor Phil, it's always harvest time. It's always harvest. The person that's trusting, it's always harvest. I'm never ceasing bearing fruit. Why? Because I'm trusting in the Lord. You know when your, your fruitful season is? It's right now. It's right now. Your fruitful season is right now. You say, well, pastor, I don't under, it, it doesn't, you don't have to understand it. The issue is I'm going to trust in God. And the person that trusts in God, it tells us not to fear or be anxious. It says, no, not cease bearing fruit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's look at Psalms 125. Well, we pray for them, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Psalms 125. So uh, someone that trusts in the Lord is like a tree. Psalms 125 gives us another picture of what trust looks like. Verse 1 says, Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which could be moved. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved. Cannot be moved. Those that trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion. So not only trusting in the Lord cause it makes you like is like a tree, but when you trust in the Lord, you're like a mountain. 
You're like a mountain. Get a picture in, in, in your mind. We, we would go to uh, uh, Tanzania and we would look. We would look at a distance and we look at Kilimanjaro and we look at that mountain. See, that's what your trust is. You have to allow your trust to become like that mountain because your trust like that mountain will destroy the mountains that you're standing in front of. Those that trust in the Lord will be like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, cannot be moved. How, Satan, I'm not moving. I'm not moving. Hallelujah. I'm glad you, I, I, didn't, I didn't ask you to say it, but you, you were great. Let's go ahead and say it. Satan, I'm not moving. I'm going to the other side. Say, I'm going to the other side. So when we see ourselves from the position of Jesus and not the disciples, because Jesus is our example, not the disciples. Now we can learn from the disciples and we can learn from these stories. And we're so grateful that Jesus said he prayed for them that we would, all those that would believe on his word, on their word. So I'm grateful for their word. But the thing is, is my model is Jesus. And I want to get to the point that when I'm in the middle of the storm, I have the ability to sit back and rest. Why? Because I trust. I trust. I trust. I'm going to the other side. I'm going to the other side. Hallelujah. It doesn't mean it's easy. It doesn't mean it's going to happen automatic. The issue is I'm just got to release trust. Lord, I trust in you that you're going to get me to my destiny. I trust you. I trust you. Let me ask you a question. How could Jesus speak to the storm? How could Jesus, they wake him up and say, he goes, peace, be still. How could Jesus do that? Because he was founded on something and he was established in something. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Okay, can you put up John 1, verse 14? John 1, verse 14. How could Jesus speak, peace, be still? Let me say this. It's because of what he was filled with. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's Jesus. And we beheld his glory. That's Jesus. He was the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of what? Go to verse 17. Hallelujah. For the law was given through Moses... But grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Jesus could speak to the storm because of what he was filled with. That, that, lets me, that gives me an idea of when I'm going through a storm, what am I filled with? Because your response to the storm is going to be a determination of what's in me. Jesus was filled with grace and truth. What is that? The truth is the word of God. What is the grace? It's the favor. It's the ability of God. So when Jesus understood that he was filled with the word of God and he was filled with the power of God, he was then able to speak to a storm and cause it to be still. So our responsibility is get to a place where we are filled with grace and truth. And as we're filled with grace and truth, we'll make it to the other side. When Jesus said, peace be still, and it said the sea, be, had, there was a great calm, a mega calm. Now, when he said, peace be still, the storm became calm, right? But we have an idea of this peace, meaning without peace, meaning without difficulty. I, I'm at peace because I don't have any difficulty. Does that make sense? But you need to understand that the peace of God is not 
tranquil. Now hear this. The peace of God is the power of God that releases, that releases the calm. You see, the peace of God is actually the power of God that causes the calm. Peace is actually power. Peace is not being void of difficulty. Peace is the power that produces the calm in the difficulty. So when Jesus was filled with grace and truth, he was then able to release his trust in God and knowing God was going to back him every step of the way. Let me close with this. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. You're receiving something today. 2 Corinthians 1. Thank you, Father. Let's look at verse 8. You're going to the other side because you trust in God, number one. You're going to the other side because you're filled with grace and truth. Hallelujah. Now, the Apostle Paul, he went through great challenges and great difficulty. If being in the will of God meant that you would be without difficulty, then Paul was never in the will of God. Look at verse 8. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble... There was trouble which came to us in Asia when we were burdened beyond measure above strength so that we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not, what, trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Uh, You know, Paul could have used a lot of different things, but he used raising the dead. Not to trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Meaning, God does things that are impossible. That we should not trust in ourselves, but we trust in the God who raises the dead. Now get this. Who delivered us from so great of death? And does deliver us in whom we, what, trust? That he will still deliver us. Let me ask you a question. Has God delivered you before? Let me see your hands. Paul was saying also, he, he he delivered us in the past. He delivered us from that circumstance. And he will yet deliver us. I want you to know that as you trust him, you can hold on to the fact that he delivered you yesterday. He will deliver you today. And he will deliver you in the future. Hallelujah. The thing is, is... It is our belief has to go from just a belief to trust. Yes. Trust. Trust. Hallelujah. You're going to the other side. Yes, yes. Hallelujah. Father, we just thank you for your word today. Amen. Hallelujah. We thank you for your word today. Yes, Lord. Mm. Hallelujah. While you're... While you're seated there, if you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, I'm going through a storm. I'm going through a storm. Our marriage is going through a storm. Our finances are going through a storm. Ministry is going through a storm. Your business is going through a storm. Go ahead and stand to your feet.